welcome to our um, nursing home infection control training series, session number two. Um, we are really excited to have you join us again. Um, we have a new platform today that has an increased uh, number of participants um, that can join with us. Uh, we have a few reminders before we can get before we get started. Um, for the best interactive experience, it is recommended that you join the audio through your computer. Uh, the compliance slides and the recording from today's session will be shared via email to all participants on the call within the next week, in addition to being posted to the QIOprogram.org website. During the open discussion period, please keep in mind that we will work to answer as many questions and comments as time permits, but if there are any unanswered questions, we will address those as well in the post-event materials. Um, so without further ado, this is Tracy Archibald from CMS. I would like to um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the speakers for today. Um, the first and last portions of the presentation will be provided by Marguerite McLaughlin. Marguerite McLaughlin is a skilled nursing facility and quality improvement expert and a passionate national leader and educator focused on improving the lives of nursing home residents. With over 30 years of experience, Ms. McLaughlin uses unique insights and experience to assist organizations transform care and enhance their workforce. She led the team that developed the HATCH, the Holistic Approach to Transformational Change, a person-centered change framework. HATCH realigns care systems and ensures the voices and choices of residents are at the heart of all care to improve the quality of care and satisfaction for all who live in our nursing homes. Ms. McLaughlin also served as Vice President of Education and Member Relations at the Rhode Island Healthcare Association and worked in the nation's capital as Senior Director of Quality Improvement at the American Healthcare Association. She earned a Master's Degree in Holistic Counseling at Salve Regina in, Regina in Newport, Rhode Island and applies this knowledge to individualized care and organizational culture. The middle part of this training session will be brought to us by David Johnson. Dave Johnson has been employed with IPRO since December of 2002, and IPRO is the, the Quinn QIO, um, specifically on the Nursing Home Quality Improvement Project as a Senior Quality Improvement Specialist. David has been a licensed nursing home administrator since 1977 and is licensed in both New York and Massachusetts. He has personal hands-on experience as an administrator in a variety of settings from small, private, to large corporately owned facilities. In addition to being a licensed nursing home administrator, Dave has also been a certified trainer in the MDS 3.0, a master trainer in Team Steps, and as a certified even alternative associate. Thank you both for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today, and I will turn the floor over to you, Marguerite. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tracy. On behalf of the IPRO Quinn QIO, we want to thank you all for joining us today. IPRO, with its partners Clarence and Elcentric Advisors, serve approximately 1,500 nursing homes across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. On a daily basis, our associates provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to nursing homes, helping them with infection prevention, COVID-19 support, and frequently tailors education programs to the specific needs of providers. We do hope that you'll give us a call. We'd love to be able to help you as well. We were asked to share with you today some strategies for screening and testing and early detection. Our reference point for our presentation comes from sound quality improvement principles and information from the CDC. But we wanted also to honor and acknowledge the myriad of stories that are flowing out of nursing homes who are in constant state of learning new ways to do things in an unprecedented time. On a daily basis, they are innovating, inventing, and creating new ways to comfort and protect. The care of people with dementia, for instance, has always come with its own set of challenges. But how do you explain social isolation to someone with dementia, let alone execute social distancing on a memory care unit? These remarkable people are doing it. 
the one's training and the use of PPE might have included a stereotypical gauze gown, but what do you do when the PPE that you were issued to your organization looks more like a camping tarpaulin with a cut in the sides of the arms? These remarkable people are doing it every day, reinventing care and comfort under the most difficult and deadly of circumstances. No one could have imagined, however, that homes were facing the perfect storm. Prior to the arrival of the novel coronavirus, homes were already facing staffing shortages estimated in some states at approximately 40%. These organizations that had moved away from an institutional model of care were demonstrating new dimensions of leadership and levels of success in quality, staffing, and satisfaction. But not everybody had gotten on to this brave new age of person-centered care, leaving some centers with an old model and outdated practices. And then there were COVID and then COVID-19 bursting on the scenes, throwing all of our well-oiled systems and drills and training and sophistication into a hurricane of turbulence, revealing our lack our shortages, but most of all, our humanity. Some might dwell on these gaps, but what is really happening is reinvention, refinement, and a remarkable ability to do better, go longer, know more, find better ways. It won't look the same when we're done, but together I think we'll make it awesome. One of the stellar things that we have, been, we have seen done by leaders and staff that is separating some organizations from others is their ability to work their infection prevention plan. I imagine that if I were to ask them to hold up their plan to the Zoom camera, I would no doubt be confronted by a dog-eared, coffee-stained, highlighted, sanitizer-stained document that hadn't been out of the infection prevention staff member's site since sometime back in January. It's a point of reference, sure, but it's also the means of staying grounded. The plan is the pause that refreshes. It anticipated COVID and Armageddon and likely has an answer somewhere in its pages for any other disaster. In homes that are winning the COVID battle, we see them communicating information from the plan to staff, offering reminders and correction on processes and procedures. It also serves as the backbone for education. These centers have leaders, charge nurses and staff whose compassion and empathy opens up a world of honest communication so that mistakes are explored for the improvement, not shaming. In homes that are winning, we see them reaching out to experts, asking questions, engaged in learning about the virus. Despite time constraints, they are taking time to audit their systems. There are some great audit tools available from your QIO. Determined to do the right thing, they are, preserving, they are persevering even when running into new systems, waivers, payments, reimbursement systems, and enrollment processes that are overwhelmed by users. Organizations with their hearts set on winning are reaching out, asking questions, being transparent about knowledge gaps. They're working together to find the answers to invent the new innovative solution. As we consider the homes with whom we're working, many of the questions we receive focus on these three elements from the CDC, keeping COVID out of the building, detecting cases quickly, and stopping the transmission. Keeping COVID out is a reference to taking every precaution and mitigating to the degree possible the unnecessary of the entry of COVID into the building, and certainly not a reference to admissions. Let's take a look at some of these three key steps what, that others are doing related to this. Keeping COVID out was one of the early challenges for many, not having yet the science to recognize the asymptomatic phenomenon of COVID. Armed with that information, Organizations jumped into action, creating wellness stations at a single point of entry. Limiting access to one door allowed for a hyper-sanitized area and a place to perform wellness checks. What started as a rather clunky impediment to the day's work was transformed into a streamlined, efficient process that continued to improve by the day. Because of exposure, some homes found it valuable to conduct a wellness check which included questions about one's general health, sense of smell and taste, respiratory sy symptoms and travel, temperatures were taken. Many homes adopted the quick clinic model and had all the necessary materials and sanitizers available. If, serve, if served, in, it served an ulterior motive, 
by being the info center, providing updates and information to help keep both staff and residents safe. Spreadsheets help to keep track of staff responses and temperature and checklists help to ensure that all the questions were completed. The trade associations have created great materials for tracking, as do many of the QIOs. Because of the exposure, some homes found it valuable to conduct a mid-shift check as staff members who were starting to feel unwell would often not want to leave knowing that they would be leaving the co their coworkers shorthanded. Other homes would have a self-assessment at the end of the shift. As the process improved, non-direct care workers were trained to man the clinic, serving a valuable service that allowed RNs to perform other valuable tasks. Several homes adopted a gently rolling, staggered shift to avoid traffic jams at the wellness station. The rolling shifts also helped with childcare burdens for those who needed um, a later stop. Ways that savvy leaders are keeping COVID out on an operational level include investing in an organizational culture that prioritizes safety and wellness of staff, not just during COVID, but on an ongoing basis. This includes such things as paid sick leave and anticipating the number of days out when covering shifts. Some have switched entirely to 12 hour shifts to limit the rotation of staff through three shifts, but also to bolster the two shifts with the third shift personnel. In keeping COVID out, homes are keeping an eye on agency staff, inquiring about where they have worked most recently and investigating the degree to which COVID is affecting that setting. Many homes are picking up per diem staff full time to ease staffing strain, have a more robust shift of workers operating, but especially to limit per diem staff from working at other nursing homes and bringing COVID into theirs. Capitalizing on waivers, homes are bolstering staffing by using people trained under the eight hour CNA training program. Many whose skills are improving are considering full CNA training in the foreseeable future. In Rhode Island, the Department of Labor is working closely with the QIO on labor-related issues and has created a quasi-staffing pool to assist homes by bringing fresh employees. The National Guard is also coming in to support many tasks and efforts, including making med passes by a pharmacist on the team. Universal workers, a concept made popular years ago by those adopting culture change principles, are also being employed. Special trainings and reorganization of floors and units helps to make this possible as staff cross over roles and competencies. Electrostatic disinfectant sprayers have also become part of the new equipment and on an operational level. Many leaders have come to appreciate the subtle difference between offering incentives versus meaningful appreciation. The latter, of course, being the driver that keeps staff coming back even under the most difficult of circumstances. Sadly, for um, residents, families, and staff, the absence of visits has added dreadfully to the sense of isolation. Many staff are also reporting a noticeable decline in cognition on the part of many residents. One home described a situation where having moved to phase two, where a few residents were allowed to gather, residents were comfortable and uncomfortable and fearful leaving their rooms. It's a situation that many will likely have to address in the coming weeks. Where positive stories erupted in the media related to nursing homes, they focused on unique technologies being used that helped keep COVID out, but allowed families to communicate. Things like Echo Show and Portal, little eight inch desktop screens powered by the internet on a swivel base that allow families to drop in on loved ones to see each other while chatting. One home with the permission of families created a phone tree that families used to pass along news from within the home so the entire community was aware of things that had happened that day, sent pictures and news of residents who might have passed. Caring Bridge and Lots of Helping Hands are two other web-based platforms allowing people to keep in touch. Being used to combat isolation are online games like Icebreaker, allowing many people to join and see each other while playing. Keeping COVID out for many involved an array of new protocols for vendors, which identified new practices for bringing materials and themselves into the building. Many homes have also put in place new return to work policies. It 
It goes without saying that daily rounds for every resident has become a way of life for staff checking for symptoms, doing a verbal wellness check, taking temperatures. Many bring that information around into an interdisciplinary care meeting where staff share details about the residents, create a risk list identifying people they're keeping a close eye on. Things that staff are watching for are the obvious signs of cough, appetite falling off, increasing falls, confusion, or in the elderly. COVID can also first be experienced as stomach pain and diarrhea and what can appear like coronary symptoms. Many homes conduct a mid-shift huddle, which encourages CNAs to share their experiences of the day, seeks their insight, and offers support for any challenge they are experiencing. Detecting cases early involves training staff to watch for subtle signs of change and serving as the eyes and ears on the floor. Some unique situations include in helping to keep COVID cases in check, allowing staff members who have been asymptomatic for three days after having had the COVID virus come back to work on COVID, COVID units. Anyone who has worked on a memory care unit can appreciate the difficulties that COVID pre presents. Swabbing is one of those particular areas. If you're suspecting a case and want to detect it early, many staff members have had to find creative ways to distract residents to get a culture. One creative team found that keeping residents' hands busy in this case, rolling a ball of yarn while being swabbed made a world of difference. Residents that go out for dialysis were also tested every day, offered scrubs as they came in, and then a shower. A wonderful tool just released by the American Healthcare Association, the algorithm for test and cohorting. The algorithm walks through three primary entry points for testing prior to deciding on who and how to cohort individuals. The entry points include testing residents who develop symptoms, testing all residents simultaneously, and testing new admissions. The algorithm also walks through how to cohort if the person tested are in single person rooms or with roommates. You can find it on the website as all of the COVID materials have been made public for the good of the entire nursing home community. COVID, as I mentioned, creates challenges on memory care units Savvy staff notice the subtle changes in behavior. Discomfort can take the form of agitation or worsening confusion, even emotional signs and symptoms such as sudden sadness. Putting together a plan for them that quiets their environments but reassures them with frequent visits can be vital. Some homes putting together such a plan also consider the long game in the event the resident would need to be moved. Many of our folks with dementia can be harmed by the disruption of the move the familiar patterns and people, and so it's wise to have a plan in place. If they do have to move, bring familiar items and ensure that the receiving partner has a bag of tricks to bring comfort to the resident. We have seen the use of portable walls to create a quiet space for residents and limit stimulation from activities in outside areas. Even simple things like touchless temperature equipment can make a big difference on a memory unit. Since the requirements of participation were released, many homes have worked tirelessly to create environments where residents can thrive and feel safe. Many have improved systems, consulted with experts to make gains on quality, and have found valuable tools to help them on their quality improvement journey. As Dave and I were developing this presentation, we wanted to share with you one such tool that helps homes to get their arms around their systems and master, among other things, the process of tracking infections. I'd like to introduce Dave Johnson. Thanks very much, Margie. Um, good afternoon. Um, just for a moment, I'd like you to sit back and think about what I will call the operational landscape, um, specifically that nursing homes have in front of them. In December of 2016, the final rule was, was released um, on infection control and surveillance. Then came COVID-19 and most recently the requirement for all facilities to report COVID-19 data to the CDC through NHSN. And I'm going to take a few minutes to plant a seed for a tool to track both infections and antibiotic prescribing patterns that was initially developed in anticipation of the release of that final rule. Consider this tool as an option or complement 
to assist in the compliance with that final rule, not to take the place of NHSN reporting, but as a complement to the overall infection surveillance system that you should already have in place. Think of it as a one-stop shop to see all infections at a moment's notice that are currently in your building and all of the important data components that are part of that internal tracking and surveillance. Now, a couple of points within the final rule stated that each facility had to ensure that they established facility-wide systems for the prevention, identification, investigation, and control of infections. The final rule also stated that any surveillance system had to include both a data collection tool and the use of nationally recognized surveillance criteria with examples that were mentioned in the final rule such as the McGeer and Loeb criteria as well as NHSN. This slide also indicates that I was revising the current tool to incorporate COVID-19. With the assistance of Dr. Genwa Damyadi, who is, she's an infectious disease physician and professor of medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center, I was able to complete what we believe at this point are the appropriate revisions to the tool. Obviously, I expect that some future revisions um, are going to be necessary as we increase uh, our understanding of COVID-19. Now, I developed this tool specifically in Excel because Excel is a very common computer program within most, if not all, nursing homes. It is um, one tool developed to track and analyze the infections within a facility, antibiotic prescribing patterns, calculated days of therapy, any prophylaxis use. It calculates infection rates both facility-wide and it has the ability to separate the data instantly by user-defined locations. For example, they could be units, individual units, floors, wings, whatever the user determines is appropriate for the facility. I mentioned antibiotic prescribing patterns, and they are summarized by both the prescribing group within a facility as a whole, as well as patterns by individual prescribers. All of the calculations, summaries, and graphs within the tool are immediate as soon as the data is entered into that tool. Now this slide lists the one-time entries that are made on the data entry sheet within the tool. You'll see that the information asked for is appropriate to any data collection tool, including the obvious entries such as resident name, room location, admission date, as well as date of infection, whether the infection was facility acquired, uh, what the actual infection is from the drop down, and you'll note that I placed an asterisk next to this as an indication of the revision to include COVID-19, which as I mentioned uh, a short time ago has been completed. Any symptoms, the fact whether the infection met facility adopted criteria, and again, I reference you back to the requirement within the final rule. And then the tool collects any antibiotic use with start and end dates, if it started in the hospital, who the prescriber was, whether it was for prophylaxis or treatment, as well as any additional comments that may be offered in a free text field. I mentioned that all the data summaries and graphs are instantaneous, and this screen is just a representation of one of those many reports that are in the tool itself. This particular one is the facility-wide summary, but there are, are separate identical summaries for each individual user-defined area that you set within your facility, as well as the detailed prescribing patterns for the antibiotic use. Embedded within the tool itself are also resource tabs for both the McGear and Loeb criteria for very quick access and reference by the user so they don't have to leave the tool at all to reference those, those uh, particular resources. 
In very quick summary, this is one tracking tool designed to be used monthly. The tool is saved as an individual file and there is a month end routine that automatically removes all of the discharged residents, all resolved infections, and completed antibiotics. It basically is scrubbing the file to be able to move all of the remaining data into a new file for the start of the new month. So there is no need to reload the basic data that's uh, necessary to start tracking for the next month. All, the, all of the uh, summaries and graphs are formatted for easy printing. And even the individual prescriber reports can easily be saved and shared electronically with the individual prescriber as a PDF. Um, since the summary does not contain any PHI. Uh, I mentioned there's the ability to carve up the data into as many as 16 separate user-defined locations, and you have the ability to track as many as 25 separate prescribers. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it back over to Margie for the last few slides. Margie, you might be on mute. Thanks so much, Dave. I want to turn it over to our um, next, um, I want to thank everyone and um, turn it over to um, our friends at CMS. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Angel? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Angel Davis, and I just want to uh, go over some of the nursing home NHSN requirements um, on reporting COVID-19 cases. Uh, so as you're aware, on April 19th, uh, CMS announced new regulatory requirements. Um, I am hearing a little feedback, so if you aren't Speaking. If you could just place your phone on mute, thank you. Um, so again, um, it requires nursing homes uh, to inform residents and their families uh, and representatives of COVID-19 cases in their facilities. And as, as a part of President Trump's opening up America, uh, CMS requires nursing homes to report those COVID-19 cases directly to CDC's National Healthcare Safety Network. Um, CMS also requires nursing homes to fully cooperate with the CDC surveillance efforts uh, around COVID-19 spread. Uh, and this was the result of a joint effort uh, with the CMS CDC work group on nursing home safety. Uh, and CMS has uh, made this data public, publicly available um, as of today uh, on nursing home compare. Um, and so uh, the last data, um, that we received as of May 24, 2020, about 12,500 nursing homes, um, approximately 80% of the 15,400 Medicare and Medicaid nursing homes had uh, reported the required data uh, to CDC. Um, so I think that's um, certainly great work um, on the part of the nursing homes that have reported up until that point. Uh, and in a press release released on Monday, um, June, uh, Monday this week, uh, to help nursing homes implement, implement infection control best practices, CMS will provide technical assistance through the quality improvement organizations, the QIOs. Uh, so CMS and CDC will continue to monitor the data it receives uh, through the new nursing home COVID-19 surveillance system to identify nursing homes with outbreaks and work with governor's offices and states to keep nursing home residents safe. Next slide. Uh, so just wanted to call your, call your attention. Um, this is an announcement. Uh, many of you are uh, likely aware that we have a toolkit on state actions to mitigate COVID-19 prevalence in nursing homes. 
And so version 3.0 will be released uh, on June 15th, uh, 2020. Um, and so I included the web address and link uh, to access version two, um, which is below. Next slide. So now we've reached our question and uh, open discussion and questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angel, for sharing that. Um, I'd like to also introduce our colleague from the CDC, Dr. Namali Stone, um, who is graciously um, with us today to help answer um, some questions that you may have. Um, we would like to open up the phone lines right now for any um, audio questions that we can get. And we're gonna go ahead and start with um, some of the questions that we've received through the chat. Um, so the first question is, why test weekly in all skilled or ALF if there has been no COVID, res no COVID um, positive residents and no sustained transmission occurring in the community? And Namali? Hey, hi everyone. Uh, it's Namali Stone. Um, and I, I've seen a couple of questions around testing and um, decisions about the serial testing for healthcare personnel um, related to reopening. So I think a couple of points to make. Um, the first is that, that a lot of the guidance around testing, having an initial test and, and serial test um, is based on knowing that as we start to loosen restrictions, we may have opportunities for COVID to be reintroduced into centers. So the other part of that guidance is recognizing that the circumstances in a community will change over time. And so the state and local public health um, programs should be a huge uh, part of the decision making around testing, um, especially as we start to see hopefully COVID not circulating as widely in communities. So there is flexibility to work with public health partners to you know make this work um, based on the circumstances of that each center thanks for those questions thanks namali so uh david we've been receiving a number of questions regarding the uh, tracking, tracking document, uh, how, can you tell us um, where that's located? Uh, we can also send that out um, as well, but just wanted to know if we could address that here. Sure. Um, it, it's very simple. All you need to do is um, send me a very simple email asking me for a copy of it. I can send it to you. My email is very easy. It's djohnson at ipro.org. It's djohnson at ipro.org. And I'll send it right out to you electronically. Thank you, Dave. That's very generous of you to send your email address directly. Um, thank you so much. Um, the next question again is for Dr. Namali Stone. What advice can you give to facilities that continue to struggle with getting NHSN access for COVID-19? Um, we, but NHSN help desk has um, been harder to get in touch with. Um, I can take a first stab at that, and, and Molly, if you want to answer um, it further, um, you can. You can definitely also reach out to your local QIO um, to. Um, for, for any help um, that you may need for this as well. And you can find your local QIO at qioprogram.org. Um, but uh, Dr. Stone, do you have other advice? No, I do want to just acknowledge um, how much we recognize that these past few weeks and uh, with the surge of facilities enrolling 
has it's been um, a process and challenging at times to um, quickly resolve um, some of the questions that are coming to the help desk. And so I just want to thank all of you for your perseverance in this. And um, and I agree that um, our Queen QIO colleagues have a lot of great um, experience and, and are wonderful resources um, when it comes to NHSN use. And, and, um, and so if the help desk isn't immediately accessible, they may have some of those answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Angel. Um, uh, one of the questions that uh, we received was asking where on nursing home compare uh, can you find um, that information? So that would be located on the spotlight page of nursing home compare, and that's where you can find um, the CDC uh, data posted there. Uh, Namali, um, we did uh, receive a another question, um, just kind of process related. Um, so, is there a process for correcting NHSN data if it was entered incorrectly? Yes, absolutely. So a facility user can go into the system and edit um, data that had been previously submitted, um, and those updates will kind of um, replace whatever erroneous information, you know, or whatever um, changes you need to make. Thank you so much. Um, Again, for uh, Namali, um, how do you handle um, a situation where a resident refuses testing during the outbreak? Right. No, I think that's a really um, important issue. And, and certainly, um, residents have autonomy and, and can decline testing just like they could decline other treatments or services. So when when it's a circumstance where a resident, say, has symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19 infection um, and they decline testing, then we would recommend that they um, remain um, in transmission-based precautions cared for um, until their symptoms have resolved and they meet that symptom and time-based criteria for discontinuation of precautions. It's um, sort of making a presumption um, that they may, that it may be COVID and so to you make it as safe as possible for caregivers and, and others that residents would be um, ideally placed in a private room and, and cared for with precautions. I will say that it is uh, not recommended to cohort uh, symptomatic residents into a COVID designated unit if they do not have confirmed infection. And that is um, because we have seen uh, individuals that did not have COVID, maybe had some other respiratory virus or some other condition that, that looked like COVID, but um, tested negative. So you, you, know, you are in a circumstance there where um, you would be trying to care for that resident in place um, and monitor if they are in a shared room, monitor closely others that, that um, are in that shared space if they cannot be moved. And if the, the resident is asymptomatic and declining, then it's somewhat the circumstance by which um, the testing is being deployed. So if there's evidence of active spread on a unit, we already recommend that you care for all of the individuals on that unit as if they may have COVID infection. And, and so the decision would be based on the facility's um, process for 
you know, containing. Thanks. I know testing um, brings up a whole lot of a whole lot of scenarios and questions. So appreciate the question. Thank you, uh, Namali. Uh, we do have another question for you, Namali. So, if a nursing home enters a resident's death for their facility, even if the resident died in the hospital, does the hospital also count that death? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I um, I may have to defer that to just double check with my colleagues who um, manage the surveillance data anal you know analysis because I think the the question is getting at well are you kind of counting the same event in more than one place um, right now um, I believe the recommendation is that if if a resident has uh, died um, from COVID, even if they had been moved somewhere else, the facilities should be counting those. If they were, you know, receiving care uh, at the time that their symptoms, their infection began and, and, um, and started to manifest. So I would approach it in that way. And um, if I can get additional information about how that might be adjusted on the other, you know, on the other side, from the hospital viewpoint, I will let you know. Right now, we are not merging those two sources of information. So I think that is also relevant um, right now. We're just looking at what is happening in the nursing homes separate from what is being reported by hospitals. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone. Um, I have a question for Marguerite. Um, um, I think you touched on this during your presentation, but how do you recommend um, quarantining um, in an Alzheimer's unit or a memory unit? Margie? Um, yes, hi, thank you. Uh, um, carefully and with great uh, love. <laughs> What we find, um, uh, the home that, um, one of the homes that we worked with had um, put up some really interesting um, gentle barriers, almost like um, things that we saw in um, office spaces um, for folks who, have, who work in a cube. Um, those, those help to um, distract residents or help them to not be so aware of um, um, hallways and egresses. Um, what we also saw, and the reason that I kind of put a little more effort into some of the um, uh, slides around um, some of the activities, is that for, for our folks who have dementia, um, having that unlimited empty time is so horrible. And so um, having, having folks who can um, volunteers who can help out by reading, um, of course, having folks go through protocols so that they can be an assistant um, to the folks on the special care units. Uh, we also found that some of the um, CNAs who had been trained for the eight-hour programs were actually being utilized to help with um, keeping people um, somewhat, as much isolated as possible to practice social distancing by helping out, um, by giving folks lots to do. Um, uh, is it is it possible? Um, it, it, it's it's challenging. It's it's challenging, but um, folks have come up with remarkable, innovative ways to um, be able to do that. Thank you, Marguerite. I uh, also want to let everyone know in terms of the uh, the tools, uh, we will also be posting a link um, with the training materials on the qioprogram.org site as well.
So, Tracy, uh, do we have any other questions that we can address at this time? Um, I think there are um, some specific questions about uh, NHSN reporting. Um, I think there's a lot of detail to those questions and um, and and how that reporting gets documented. So um, what we can do is commit to answering um, many of those questions um, via the materials that we provide post training, um, and that would be posted on QIO. Program.org. Um, so, if you had specific questions that you've entered, we really appreciate those um, that are specific to the NHSN uh, COVID-19 reporting module. Um, we'll work to get those answered um, post-event and posted for you, and we'll um, let you know via email when that is um, available. All right, I think um, we have reached the end of our session. If we can go to the last slide. Um, we'd like to thank our presenters today, um, as well as Dr. Namali Stone for helping to answer questions. Um, look forward to work, uh, seeing you and hearing from you next week on Thursday, June 11th from four to five Eastern. Um, for our next training on um, nursing home infection control. And um, our next training will be focused on um, uh, cohorting. So look forward to um, hearing more details about cohorting strategies. Uh, we appreciate your time and um, contributions today. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>